So uh, back to the church. What happened in the upper room um, at, at um, after after his resurrection? Yes. That uh, a time of Pentecost, yes. um, when the Holy Spirit fell. Yes. Why don't we see that sort of thing happening today in our churches? Have churches kind of missed the message somewhere along the way? It did happen in, in Wesley's day. It has happened all through history. But at Wesley's time, two, three things happened. First of all, the Enlightenment came in with the atheistic doctrine. It said there's no such thing as supernatural. Secondly, the Christians divided into two. They, they became the liberal or the modernists who said we... We like the Christian ethic, but we don't like the literal Bible. So we'll explain away everything that's in the Bible, which is doesn't seem explainable by natural means. The evangelicals, on the other hand, said Jesus is coming tomorrow. Jesus is coming soon. So let's get as many people saved and into the lifeboat of the church as we can. And they fail to take the responsibility for the way society was operated. In fact, they withdrew. And in my young day, I was discouraged from joining such things as the Chamber of Commerce or Rotarians, or particularly going into politics. The evangelical said, we've got to go flat out, evangelizing, getting people saved. And that was all, all, all that mattered. So that missionaries went out by their hundreds and did a wonderful job, in Africa particularly, of getting people saved and building churches, coming along, studying the Bible and whatnot. But they didn't teach the Africans anything about government, how to run the country. So... The African leaders who were educated in missionary schools turned to communism as being the most obvious way to do things. Communism didn't work, and as a result, dictators took over. Now the dictators, one by one, are being dislodged too. But what is going to re replace them? Have we, as Christians, got answers for running countries? besides running our own life. So it's almost like Christianity withdrew from being involved in the practical side of, of, of the practical side of Christianity. That's right, even with education. Most of the education schools were started by, by Christians, so were hospitals. But as the, the governments began to take over, the Christians said, well, this is the government's job, it's not our job. And so Christian, there was a dichotomy between sacred and secular. Uh, we'll leave the secular things of the government, but the spiritual things, the sacred things, will happen in the church. And so that you did your sacred on Sunday, and then you did your secular on Monday. And that is not Christianity. Christianity, the gospel, according to Jesus Christ, is the whole of life, so that when we run our farms, we are cooperating with God in creation, and we need to see that as a calling. So this idea that you should aspire to become part of the ministry team or the choir or, right. or the praise and worship uh, team or, or something like that as, as the ultimate Christian goal has really sent us off track. It's the separation of Christians into two groups, the clergy and the laity. There's no room for that in the New Testament, no room at all. So the idea of the separation of religion and state is not a, a, a scriptural concept? No, it's, it's completely unscriptural, yes. yes. We haven't, we haven't done a very good job of actually, when we've decided to get into politics, of making an impression there, though. That's why I keep going back to what Wesley did. See, he, he taught his converts, thousands of them, to see their beliefs and their trust in Christ 
as affecting the whole of life. And that's why prisons began to get cleaned up after that time. There was a practical was the involvement in society. Right. That's right, yeah. But, yeah. Abolish slavery, improve working conditions, right. yes. get involved in reformation within the prisons. Exactly. It's relationships. Yes, relationships. And that's what I, I've been saying for years now. Life is a matter of relationship. First of all, with God. Secondly, with people, starting with your own family. Thirdly, with things, creation. And our relationship to creation round about us is important. It's a spiritual thing. Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. But we've been presenting our souls, our spirits, but we haven't seen our bodies. So that to introduce dancing into a spiritual service in the church in my young day was absolutely anathema. But today, you can express your spiritual aspirations through dance, through art, through music. And this is not something new. They knew this in Wesley's day. They known it throughout history. But for some reason or other, between Wesley and today, that got lost. And now we've got to return to that. And there is a great movement in the church and out of the church. There are thousands leaving the established churches because they want to see their spirituality being related to everyday life. They would far rather go to a small group and discuss life and how to apply the New Testament to their life than go along on Sunday morning, sit in rows, fellowship with the back of the head in front of you, listen to a man out front. They want to be real. People want to be real. I wonder too, I mean, with technology, with the web, with um, so much available to the modern believer today, whether they're not more informed, the search of the believer, than often the people in the pulpit, what is this going to do to what we... Is this going to cause even a, a further exodus, do you think? Or should the church be using the resources that are available to inform and be part of society? I, I think that we're at the beginning of a huge new reformation, myself, in the, in churches. In the churches. Uh, I was meeting with a group of ministers who want to produce unity amongst the churches in Auckland. And after we'd been meeting for some time, I said, look, what we should be doing is endeavouring to find ways and means of showing how the, the members of our congregation can transform the society in which they live. I said, we have been teaching them how to accept salvation through faith in Christ, be born again. We've been teaching them how to accept the Holy Spirit of their lives. But I said, we're not teaching them how they can use the, allow the Holy Spirit to use them in everyday life. And you know what the minister said to me? That's not our job. So I said, well, whose job is it? They said, that's your job, and laughed. I said, why is it not your job? They said, because we come out of the university, go to theological college, and we're trained how to run a church. We're not trained to, trained to how to run a business or anything. We don't know anything about that. So I said, well, somebody should be training people how to be Christian doctors, Christian teachers. I don't like that word Christian myself, because it means a thousand different things to a thousand different people. But I know what I mean. And I mean doing the will of God as he wants it done. In the marketplace. In the marketplace, in life. Where it counts. Seven days a week. With people. That's right. With Alongside, people. I mean, it's, it's funny, isn't it, that so often um, we exclude those people who are outside of the church yeah. for the safety of the walls and what's between them yeah. and yet the call for the church is to be part of transforming the world. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, 
Yes. We have been going out in society and trying to contact people in order to preach the gospel to them. To get them saved and bring them back into church. But what has happened in Glen Innes is one of our members went to the police and said, give me 20 of your children at risk and I will train up 20 young mentors and we'll match them up one by one and they will relate to each other over months or even years. Now he's got 40. Now we don't go to them and say to them, you're a sinner and you've got to come to Christ. We go and demonstrate the love of God and get their interest. And before long they say, why don't you swear? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And we explain, because of the love of Christ. So we say, belong, believe, and then behave. But we used to say, you've got to behave before you can belong to us. And then believe, because you belong.